Dear friends, Understanding critical essays is very important for net, set, gate and such competitive exams in English literature. Let us read critical essays together and try to understand them, starting from advertisement to lyrical ballads. It was published in 1798 along with the first edition. Here is the text. It is the honourable characteristic of poetry that its materials are to be found in every subject that can interest the human mind. That means poetry can be written about anything that interests the human mind. The evidence of this fact is to be sought not in the writings of critics, but in those of poets themselves. You should read the poets, you should read poetry, and you will understand that poetry can be written about any subject. That is the meaning of this first paragraph. The majority of the following poems are to be considered as experiments. So, Wordsworth is saying that Lyrical Ballads, the book, is a book of poems that are experiments. They were written chiefly with a view to ascertain how far the language of conversation in the middle and lower classes of society is adapted to the purposes of poetic pleasure. Wordsworth is saying that the poems of lyrical ballads were written in order to make sure that ordinary people's language will also give poetic pleasure. This is a very famous quotation to ascertain how far the language of conversation in the middle and lower classes of society is adapted to purposes of poetic pleasure. That means poetry can be written in ordinary language. Readers accustomed to the gaudiness and inane phraseology of many modern writers, if they persist in reading this book to its conclusion, will perhaps frequently have to struggle with feelings of strangeness and awkwardness. They will look round for poetry and will be induced to inquire by what species of courtesy these attempts can be permitted to assume that title. What is the meaning of that? Readers who are accustomed to do neoclassical poetry, the readers who are accustomed to the gaudiness, the gaudiness means over-stylized, very pompous kind of poetry, inane phraseology. Their phrases in neoclassical poetry had no life. There, there was no greatness in them because they were so artificial. Readers who are accustomed to such artificial poetry, remember inane phraseology is very famous. Only in the 2022 exam, net exam, they asked this question. If only you had read advertisement to the lyrical ballads, you would have known this is Wordsworth. So, readers who are accustomed to the features of neoclassical poetry, such as gaudiness and inane phraseology, will have to struggle with strangeness and awkwardness when they read lyrical ballads. If they persist in reading this book to its conclusion, if you read lyrical ballads completely, such readers will feel strange and awkward. Are, is this poetry? They will think. They will look, look around for poetry. Because for them, poetry means gaudy language. Inane phraseology. They will feel like lyrical ballads book does not even have poetry. They will be induced to inquire by what species of courtesy these attempts, that means the poems that Wordsworth has written, by what reason, by what species of courtesy these poems can be permitted to be called poetry, to assume that title of poetry. By what means can you call these attempts or experiments poetry? Readers will say that these poems that I have written are not even poetry. Hmm. Wordsworth is saying, it is desirable that such readers, for their own sakes, should not suffer the solitary word poetry, a word of very disputed meaning, to stand in the way of their gratification. <laughs> Wordsworth is saying that don't try to get gratification by reading poetry, because poetry is not one thing, it is a word of disputed meaning. But that, while they are perusing this book, they should ask themselves if it contains a natural delineation of human passions. Don't judge my poems 
on the basis of the definition of poetry given by neoclassical people because poetry is a word of very disputed meaning when you read my book lyrical ballads just look if just look for something see if there is a natural delineation of human passions because if you ask that question do these poems have natural delineation of human passions then the answer will be yes so only look for whether this po this book contains natural delineation of human passions human characters and human incidents because these my book has human passions are there in lyrical ballads human characters are there in lyrical ballads human incidents are there in lyrical ballads and if the answer be favorable to the author's wishes that means when you read my book according to uh, human passions characters and incidents and if your answer is yes yes these are there in this book that is the answer favorable to my wishes then that they should consent to be pleased if they feel that okay this book has passions human character human incidents please consent to be pleased please agree to be pleased even though my poems are not neoclassical in spite of that most dreadful enemy to our pleasures what is the dreadful enemy to our pleasures that you will have your own pre established codes of decision so without any preconceived notion or pre established codes of decision if you approach my poetry then you will find pleasure in it because my poetry has human passions human characters and human incidents readers of superior judgment may disapprove of the style in which many of these pieces are executed readers who are used to great poetry of great neoclassical masters will disagree that this is great poetry my poems may not look very good for them so readers of superior judgment may disapprove of the style in which many of these pieces are executed it must be expected that many lines and phrases will not exactly suit their taste my poetry may not suit their taste it will perhaps appear to them that wishing to avoid the prevalent fault of the day the author that is wordsworth has sometimes descended too low are he is writing wordsworth is writing in too ordinary language he is writing in everyday language he has descended too low such readers of superior judgment might think and that many of his expressions are too familiar too colloquial and not of sufficient dignity because in neoclassical poetry what is required is language of dignity or poetic diction which you will not find in my poems it is apprehended that the more conversant the reader is with our elder writers and with those in modern times who have been the most successful in painting manners and passions the fewer complaints of this kind will he have to make so what words were the saying that don't just look at neoclassical writers if you are conversant with or familiar with our elder writers that means the greatest masters of the olden times like shakespeare for example or with those in modern times who are painting manners and passions in a non neoclassical manner if you are acquainted with writers who also write like me great writers are there who write like me if you are acquainted with them then you will not complain that is what he says an accurate taste in poetry and in all the other arts sir joshua reynolds has observed is an acquired talent so in the exam they might ask you questions like which of the following painters is uh mentioned in advertisement to lyrical ballads only if you take a look at the text of advertisement to lyrical ballads will you know an accurate taste in poetry is an acquired talent that is what sir joshua reynolds of johnson's circle has observed an accurate taste is acquired not in born which can only be produced by severe thought and a long continued intercourse with the best models of composition the best best models of composition are not necessarily neoclassical 
Joshua Rain, also who was a neoclassicist, has him, himself said that an acquired taste in accurate taste in poetry has to be acquired with your familiarity with the best models of composition. This is mentioned not so much with so ridiculous a purpose as to prevent the most inexperienced reader from judging for himself. This does not mean that the reader cannot judge for himself, but merely to temper the rashness of decision. Joshua Reynolds said that you should know the best masters, not because you cannot judge for yourself, but because he wants you to temper the rashness of your decision. Don't jump into conclusions. Don't jump into decisions and say, lyrical ballads is bad, it is not even poetry. Are don't say that. Wait. Because the best models of composition are also plain like my lyrical ballads. So, this is mentioned not so much with so ridiculous a purpose as to prevent the most inexperienced reader from judging for himself, but merely to temper the rashness of decision and to suggest that if poetry be a subject on which much time has not been bestowed, the judgment may be erroneous. If you have not read enough poetry, if you have not spent enough time reading poetry, then your judgment may be erroneous. You have to read widely. You have to read the masters. You have to know the best composition. Only then you will be able to judge properly. And that in many cases, it necessarily will be so. Many people will be inexperienced. Many people will not know great masters. So, Joshua Reynolds is warning against a rash decision. The tale of Goody Blake and Harry Gill is founded on a well-authenticated fact which happened in Warwickshire. Goody Blake and Harry Gill. This is a poem by Wordsworth. It is a story, a real happening in Warwickshire. Of the other poems in the collection, it may be proper to say that they are either absolute inventions of the author or facts which took place within his personal observation or that of his friends. So Wordsworth quoted this poem, this title, and said that actually happened in Warwickshire. The other poems are either inventions of the author, the author's imagination, or things that happened in authors or his friends' personal observation. The poem of the thorn, that is another famous poem, as the reader will soon discover, is not supposed to be spoken in the author's own person. This is of course not the author's experience because the thorn is about a mother who has lost her child. So it is not the author's own voice that you hear here. The character of the loquacious narrator will sufficiently show itself in the cause of the story. He is not... Uh, you know, breaking the suspense, he's saying, you will read for yourself and understand. The rhyme of the ancient mariner, that is also mentioned in the advertisement by uh, Coleridge. The rhyme of the ancient mariner was professedly written in imitation of the style as well as of the spirit of the elder poets. That means medieval, earlier poets, not the neoclassical. So the rhyme of the ancient mariner has the style and spirit of the medieval and earlier poets. But with a few exceptions, the author believes that the language adopted in it has been equally intelligible for these three last centuries. Even though it is taken in the, it is written in the style of the medieval poets, it is still intelligible today also. In the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries also, you can understand this style. The lines entitled Expostulation and Reply and those which follow arose out of conversation with a friend who was somewhat unreasonably attached to modern books of moral philosophy. In Expostulation and Reply, a friend is telling the poet, why are you uh, wasting time with nature? Go read books. Read moral philosophy. Friend is advising the poet. And the poet is saying, no, nature is the best teacher. So thus ends the advertisement to the lyrical ballads. Like this, we will read more and more critical essays or excerpts from critical essays together in order to get you ready for net, set and gate. Hope you enjoyed this video.